Good morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Thank you for tuning in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Today is Thursday, July 22nd, and this next hour we study the inspired and true Word of God and put on our Christ goggles in Nehemiah chapter 7. Nehemiah had been tempted by the we call the unholy trinity. This is what Pastor Poppy said yesterday of Sam Ballot, uh, Tobiah, and Geshem, and they tried to make him afraid. The holy I call it the holy trinity of evil, fear, lies, and deception. And through it all, he was faithful. The wall is finished, and now we get to chapter 7, which has its own um, challenges, definitely not the same challenges. Part of it is, it's kind of like if you're trying to gather a family reunion, and your family is from around the country, and there's so many of them, you can't even keep track, nor can you pronounce their names. That is what's happening after over 100 years of being away from their homeland. They now were coming back. God's people back in the temple, back with a wall, focusing their attention back to the Lord. As we hear these words, may they work in our hearts as we once again see Christ. The gifts are ready, ready for you. A special thanks to our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation for your support of Thy Strong Word. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information, lhfmissions.org. To help us be strengthened by God's Word, we welcome back Pastor Lucas Witt of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Pastor Witt, welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Glad to be back, Brady. Pastor Witt, what's going on for you, your family, and the work of the saints at Emmanuel? Well, um, I'd say my family's doing well. Uh, it's summertime, so we're kind of gearing up for, for uh, school here pretty quick. Summer disappears after the 4th of July. <laughs> yeah, um, <true. laughs> I mean, that's 4th of July. It's like, oh, man, summer's got two weeks left, you know. So, um, But Emmanuel, yeah, I, I don't know if I've actually gone into uh, my primary role there. Um, I think it could be encouraging to the saints out there, but uh, I actually got there because uh, my primary uh, focus is actually missionary to Baltimore. They actually called and said, we want to turn our normal vicarage uh, into uh, an opportunity to, to try and uh, increase our, our giving and, uh, and acquire more funds to, uh, to send out a missionary into Baltimore. So actually, uh, 75% of my time has been geared towards uh, reaching out in Baltimore um, and clarifying who Jesus is and trying to guide him uh, guide, guide them closer to Jesus, um, whether they, they, they know who they, he is or they, they think they know who he is. Um, so that's, that's, uh, I don't think I, we've even talked about that. And boy, I don't know. I, I'm probably at the silver level now. This might be like my eighth time on this show. Right. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, and then, and then I got another, another piece of that puzzle. Um, actually just starting here July 1st, uh, there's a vacancy position that's uh, just south of Baltimore here in uh, Saint called St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Glen Burnie. Um, they had a uh, pastor Mark retire here, uh, go back closer to you in Michigan, nice. um, be around some kids there. But uh, yeah, so the circuit visitor called up and said, um, you know, what do you think about uh, stepping into this vacancy role? So basically just to clarify, they, they don't have a pastor right now and they're entering into the, the process of, you know, gathering together and praying and talking about who God may be sending them next. Uh, but they need somebody to step in in the meantime. So uh, that's too much for me and uh, Pastor Mac, the other guy. But what if we do this kind of Paul and Silas thing? And I'm definitely Silas in that situation. Um, but <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely a, the secondary guy uh, but, uh, figuring this all out. But the um, so we've come together. The yeah, we'll that's it. I, I'm the encourager who who has my. You know, I look, I'm the one who has my uh, my eyes looking like a deer in the headlights. You know, there a you bit go. more often. Um, but so we've we've come together and uh, and are filling this vacancy, um, Lord willing, until they, they find, uh, find somebody to be here for, um, Lord willing, a, a long time. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of neat to, to actually use that analogy of, um, of having, you know, two guys here to kind of compliment one another and, and share one another in this position. So Brady, I know you're, you know, you're, you can strong arm being the one guy, you know, where you're right. out there. Right. Um, so, you know, but <laughs> I, what I get, I'm not up to that snuff, you know, so, um, need some help, need some help out here. But so anyway, uh, that's, that's kind of the, <laughs> the interesting pie and the pieces of what I'm doing out here right now. And, um, next time, next time we sit down, why 
I'm assuming it's going to be the same, but in another year, it could be interesting uh, uh, what part of the mission God has for me to do out here. And that's the truth for every one of us. Um, what we talk about now, and we know this post-COVID or during COVID, I think we can probably still define us, is, is you never know. And one of the joys that I have, we have a number of pastors here who serve vacancies. And it is such a vital um, um, need within any church in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod because when a church gets vacant, it's not vacant of the Word of God. I mean, that's one of the, I don't know how else you would define it. It's it's a word that maybe can assume that everything's just kind of standing still or we're not doing anything. But no, vacancy is that the pre, the Word continues to move forward, a word and prayer and sacraments, and and it is such an important role for the sake of the, the care of the souls of that church. And so I invite our listeners to pray for St. Paul's in uh, Glen Burnie. Is that what you said? Glen Burnie? Yep. yep Did I say that yep. right? Yeah. In Glen Burnie, Maryland, uh, for the sake of their call process, but even more so that they know that the word is faithfully being proclaimed and that uh, the mission continues on. So, Pastor, any anything else you want to highlight before we get to Nehemiah 7? Uh, I think Nehemiah 7 is, is the biggest reason we're gathered today. So <laughs> I, I, I could just good. shoot the breeze all day, but <laughs> like, let's dive in there. Well, I tell you what, yesterday, Pastor Poppy and I, I think, had over 15 football analogies. So just, you know, it can be done in a good way. Just make sure you're doing doing it according to the words. So, Pastor, can you begin our time in prayer? Yeah, absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe. You have gathered your people together. You protect us, as we are reminded today, with with your great, uh, your great wall of protection, as we're reminded. Uh, you gather us together to be your people, to be a witness to the world, and to most of all know that we are your called and chosen people. Lord, as we go through your word today with uh, many unfamiliar things, many unfamiliar names uh, to remind us of the, all, all kinds of different people that you have gathered, gathered together and in, in the specific people uh, you gathered in Nehemiah's time, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would open our minds, that we would have thoughts that pursue you. Open our lips, that we would speak what you would have us to speak to your glory. Open our ears to have us hear and understand what you would have us to hear and understand in your living and active word today, Lord. Bless our study today as we pursue and understand who you are just a little bit more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As you look at chapter 7, nothing is done without a context. So, Pastor, what kind of highlights or background information do you want to share with us to help us start on the right foot in chapter 7? Sure. I, Nehemiah, I, and I didn't look up, I'm pretty sure we probably are only two at most, if any, uh, lectionary references. So it's one of those books you don't get into too often, I would say. And um, I was reminded of that going through all the names and numbers today. Uh, but uh, yeah, so so what do we have here? We're after after the exile, and uh, this is I always said to my middle schoolers, you know, when when they were the uh, Israelites were taken into uh, into exile, um, they had three three rounds of draft picks. So there's there's football analogy number yes, one, here I guess. It comes, here it comes. Right. Um, you know, there, there were three, three, three rounds of draft picks. Um, and so there were three going out and, uh, I'm not quite sure how to call it this way, you know, the third round of free agency, but, um, you know, there's Zerubel and, and Ezra. And so Nehemiah, uh, is now, um, has come back. And, uh, this is what, about a hundred years after, um, this all started. Uh, so the, this free agency process is taking a while. Um, and it's about 50 years after Ezra. So the temple, the temple has been set up, um, and going, and it seems like Ezra has been doing a, a, a pretty good job there, I guess you could say, um, as a leader and, uh, Nehemiah has, has come back and, um, some people have come back with him and, uh, they've gone through their struggles. You've, some of you have heard about those the last few days here. Uh, and today we kind of get to this, this high point. Um, he's been, he's been in charge of building up, uh, the, the city of Jerusalem all around uh, the temple there. Um, he got word that it wasn't working as quickly as he hoped. Um, and so when he comes back and as governor, he's really in charge of the uh, the walls and the rest of the city around it. So so today is, I guess there's not a whole lot of celebration. He, he's got his nose to the, to the wheel um, as far as it comes for 
uh, for working in today's text, but uh, he's they've completed completed the wall in um on oh, the spot is it 52 days mm-hmm. and yep. uh yep. oh there we go so Got it. uh yeah so so that's where we're at right now getting into uh nehemiah 7 here and uh i, I guess you could say the the wall is up um the doors are the doors are getting in there too and and he's not sitting back and sipping a margarita margarita uh, margarita uh, by any means, uh, Nehemiah may be a bit of a workaholic, <laughs> or, or, um, uh, or maybe, maybe this thought popped in my head from from uh, something before. Um, some think he may be actually preparing for for his departure, for his return uh, back uh, back to uh, Persia. There, mm. um, so he's he's there twelve years. So maybe like like any good leader, um, whether it's whether it's done right away or, or eventually, uh, to say, you know, we got to set up the future. We got to set up uh, the next leaders and make sure they're prepared. Um, kind of like, well, Paul does for Silas. So that's kind of the situation we're, we're in today. What is interesting is chapter seven is that verses four, five, and six, Chapter three is when they're there's, there's gathering the, the troops to build. And so you have all these names. You have then opposition to this work. You have uh, obvious oppression um, of certain people in this group. And you have a generosity of Nehemiah. So you really have a whole uh, swath of seeing how Nehemiah is. I've joked about this since we started this study about how Nehemiah, for many people, the only way people know about it is either, well, two things. Facing the Giants movie, that would have come out, what, 15 years ago? You know, the the, the coach said they build a wall, and he's basically telling the offensive line that they're like Nehemiah. You're like, well, I don't know if the offensive line is a one-to-one to Nehemiah. <laughs> And then the other one is, you know, politically, talk about building a wall, and all of a sudden people knew Nehemiah when it came to politics in the last seven, eight years. And it, it all of it is is a misunderstanding of the, the the depth and the rich richness that is here because he's generous to the people of Judah. He is patient with those who are evil, but yet he still prays for their demise at the same time. And then we finally get through all of this evil that surrounds him. He is steadfast in prayer and the word, and the wall gets finished. And like you said so well, it's not time to get on the hammock quite yet. Actually, let's be honest, he probably never does. Because the reality is there's always work to continue, and that's true, I think, for everybody in this world, um, that there's always more that we can be doing in service to the Lord. So I, I think it's I think it's time to get to Chapter 7. What do you think? Okay, we'll, right. we'll unpack plenty there. Let's go. All right, so a uh, reminder to our listeners, we'll be reading from the English Standard Version of Nehemiah Chapter 7. Now, when the wall had been built, and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers, The singers and the Levites had been appointed. I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And I said to them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they are still standing guard, let them shut and, and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard posts and some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no house, no houses had been rebuilt. So now we kind of, how do you say it? The wall is finished. We went through all of that. The, the people are trying to make him afraid and others. And now it's just kind of, it seemingly is some basic information. What's happening in these first four verses? Yeah, there's, two things um that stick out to me um again so he's nehemiah is clearly not convinced that the threat is over uh and so uh sanballat and tobiah he, he he's thinking they they must be still thinking about coming back but anyway he nehemiah is definitely not uh not sitting back but um he's setting up people in their different positions of vocations and and uh he's setting up the uh the gatekeepers here to watch um and they, he's setting up the the singers and the levites too uh which is really interesting um and then he's 
he's looking around and he's basically saying, <laughs> uh, we need a stimulus package here. Um, <laughs> because there's, there's just not enough people moving in. And, uh, you know, I guess we're, we're all familiar with uh, stimulus packages after the last a year and a half here, but makes me think of Baltimore. I look around and see so many, uh, so many open places and dilapidated buildings and think, yeah, we need a bunch of people to move in here too. So if any of you out there are, are inspired by uh, what, what am I is doing today, why um, think about coming out here to Baltimore, I'll you find go. you a place. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that. there's so much here. There's, there's so much here um, in, in these verses here. So uh, he sets up, the gatekeepers, which you think, okay, that's, that's normal. Right. And that's a great place to be, you know, get to be a gatekeeper, uh, you know, in the house of the Lord is a wonderful opportunity. Um, but then, then you say, wait a minute, what is he doing here with, with the singers and, and the Levites, uh, out there as well? Um, being, being watchers. I mean, you know, like, I guess I'm, I'm a poor enough singer to, to maybe scare away some people or, mm-hmm. or keep them out. But, um, you know, like I, I can't imagine, you know, Paul Gearhart and Martin Luther and, um, you know, what, who's a big name today, just, just outside our circles, you know, Matthew West and then, then, you know, staying out there and being like, wait a minute, I, I used to like write hymns and, and, and sing and, and now I'm guarding out here. So, um, and the Levites there too. So, um, I, I honestly don't have a great, uh, great insight as to what Nehemiah is doing here besides, um, he's making sure that, uh, that the gate is watched. Um, and so the, the Levites there are set up too, uh, and they're going to be set up to watch uh, the gates that come into the temple. But it's just interesting that uh, Nehemiah is, is setting up a lot of people to be uh, watching watching around that area. Um, I'll pause there in case you want to jump in. Yeah, no, that's good. And, and, and one, of the, one of the realities is in chapter 6, there's a lot of talk of do not fear because it was Tobiah, Sambalat, and, and Geshem who were constantly trying to make him fearful. And, and he, holds, uh, um, he holds strong in faith, no doubt about it. And here, I think he's, he's really just reestablishing um, the way that probably it should be. Um, maybe, maybe it once was. Who knows what it was before the exile or the captivity too, is to be able to look at this and go, okay, we're reestablishing this. He's almost creating an office of, of guard, which I thought is an interesting dynamic in this whole uh, chapter as well. And he just says, you know, here we are, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do this. But then there's other parts that shows, even though the wall's up, the temple is up, that there have not been any houses that have been rebuilt. So you can tell there's still this, uneasiness and and it's not the same as covid how although we feel more open we still feel the uneasiness kind of like you're saying in baltimore the businesses that were there be, maybe before covid or maybe before that even they're just haven't come back so there's an uneasiness there for sure as they move forward as god's people your thoughts yeah you see that opportunity for them to to be gathered there um and setting up the system so i I see. I see where you're where you're going there, Brady. And as you as you look at this, Pastor, how would we? Are there are other ways we can relate these verses to our world today. Because I, you can beat the COVID, um, the COVID, I guess you say, virus to death, uh, or you kind of hope it would go to death. But you can kind of beat it to death as if it's you know something more than it really is. But it is something that has impacted all of us. So. How would you relate these verses as they move forward without really knowing what's going to come next in our world today in the church? Well, Nehemiah seems to be a, not seems, he definitely is, a uh, somebody who's ready to, to set up his structure and do so um, you know, in, in a way that, uh, that is God-pleasing uh, for the past, present, and future. So he's, he set up the gatekeepers, the singers, the Levites, um, and then he's got, uh, he's got a leader in mind, too again, which, uh, which may be again, because he, at some point he's, he's going back there, or at least he's done with his, his leadership as governor after 12 years. But, um, you have his chosen leader or leaders and I, I try not to get too te- technical, um, in these times, but, uh, he's got a brother, um, Hanani or Hanani. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's Hananiah, um, 
he was in charge of uh, looking over the, the castle. And, and actually, there was kind of debate if this is one person, the same person, um, or two. But regardless, you can see him setting up uh, leadership in place. And what strikes me as to why he picked them, and he seems to, to defend it um, or back it up or make very clear, uh, why, why, are the, why are these people or, or this person picked? Um, and uh, the end of verse 2 there says, you know, uh, he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many are. And I think that's, that's a great reminder to us for when we're trying to, uh, well, could be rebuilding something or sustaining something. But, you know, when we're, when we're looking for um, filling leadership positions and, mm-hmm. and setting up for success, you know, all these people are going to be coming in. Um, and, and they're going to need solid leadership and what better solid leadership than somebody who is faithful and a God fearing man, or <laughs> at least more God fearing than many, um, some skills there too. But, you know, isn't that the place to begin? Isn't that the place to begin? Right. Um, you can say, well, they have these skills and talents, right. And you can say they're a great, uh, musician. They're a great, um, you know, gifted in, in this area or that area. I want to get into specifics. People can fill in their own. But, you know, when you're talking about a context of uh, we need to pursue God, especially I would say you know, in a ministry context, um, you, you got to start with that basis, right? You got to start with um, somebody who, who understands who God is and fears him and pursues him. Um, because from there you can say, well, even when things go wrong, right? Even when we have disagreements, um, even, even when we have misunderstandings, you can go back to that basis of saying, you know, we, we all pursue what the Lord wants us to do, right? That is a unifying, a unifying um, structure for us, no matter what, is we all believe that no matter what we do or, or accidentally do, um, right or wrong, we are still pursuing what God has, uh, would have us to do. And there's a sometimes hard to put your finger on how do you determine if somebody is a more faithful and God-fearing man than many? It's hard to put your finger on that. And there's some <laughs> cases where it's very, it's very clear that somebody is not looking at this through the lens of faith. And this is a tendency in the church where let's say that you need someone to do the constitution committee, right? Which is never it for all of you, our listeners that if you don't know that your church has a constitution and bylaws, it's not the most exciting thing for you to dig into and get excited about, but it is something that is very important because this is how you've agreed that you're going to operate. And there's a way that you can operate that's um, focused on the cross. And then there's ways that isn't, but let's just say you need a constitution committee. Well, you can easily say, well, we want this person or this gal or this guy who's very good at editing or somebody that's very good at leadership skills at their at their work. Well, if that person never goes to church and they're, quote, a member of your congregation, there's a chance that you could put them on a committee and it's going to go well. But then there's a very good chance that they not, they're not interested. And so they're going to look at it strictly from a business sense as opposed to a faith sense. And that is a huge difference in how you look at, 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 at a constitution, at the world, at the church, at your work. When you see it through the lens of faith, it's different because there you see that God is in charge. There you see that Christ has risen from the dead. There you see the need for grace and forgiveness. And if you're seeing it from a purely secondary point of view, you're not going to be able to see it in the same way. Is that kind of some of the, the – that's those are my thoughts on, on how you spoke about that, and that's how he's, I think, emphasizing that as well. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly it. And I, I could go into stories, you know, told to me and, and stories of situations gone through, but um, ultimately it comes down to it. You know, when we look at, when we take, take a step back, um, you know, and actually sit back in that hammock or, or down our knees in prayer, you know, we, we say, you go through scripture and you see all these things that are messed up and all these people with, you know, great skills or very little skills. Um, but right. The, the big thing is God, the only, the only final product God is looking at is, you know, is, is a saint in his eternal creation. Right. Mm. And everything else. Yes. You know, yes, we want to have good quality um, music and good quality writing and, and good quality uh, penmanship and, and good quality, everything. Right. Um, But when it comes down to it, um, it's really what is most God pleasing is not, not the product, um, but it's the pursuit of, of the people um, to pursue what he wants. And that's where I got to put in because it was, Really, I, I really in, 
thought it was really good. Um, uh, in his uh, commentary, uh, Andrew Steinman mm-hmm. on Ezra and Nehemiah, um, cause I, I stepped back and I thought, what, you know, the fear of God, like every time you read that, yeah, you got to say, it's not just running away from God. What is that? Um, so I, this is my favorite definition. I'm so excited. I'm kind of stuttering. Yeah, yeah. Um, he says it's fearing God or fear is a positive uh, filial relationship to God through faith that causes the redeemed person to want to please the heavenly father. Right. And that almost makes me think of a great question to ponder, you know, like is your utmost goal in this position to please the heavenly father? Um, I'm going to hold on to that one. So say that again, because this is, this is something we've been talking about a lot in Nehemiah because we clearly see Nehemiah as one who fears the Lord. So this is a good, uh, Dr. Simon's great commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah has many, many diamonds that he uh, presents to us in the richness of these books. So tell us again, the fear of God, how does he define it? Yeah, yeah, no, that's worth repeating again. And it's a long, <laughs> long and loaded. So <laughs> it's a, a positive filial relationship to God through faith that causes the redeemed person to want to please the heavenly father. Right. So it's, it's so Lutheran, how he sets it up, right? Jesus has brought us into a relationship um, with our heavenly father through the cross and his resurrection. Uh, the, the, we, are, we are in his kingdom. We have eternal life and our response um, as a redeemed bought back person is to want to please the heavenly father, because that's what the Holy spirit has, has done to us. And it is by the fear of God that we will move forward in this text. But right now, we need to take our break. We are studying Nehemiah chapter 7 with Pastor Lucas Witt, and we will be right back. What's happening in Germany's Lutheran churches? where Iranian refugees are flooding through the doors. What new opportunities for sharing the Christian faith are arising in communist Vietnam, and how can my church play a part? Mission speakers, all LCMS pastors from the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, will come to your church, free of charge, to preach and lead Bible studies tying into this exciting work going on all around the world. To schedule your speaker, call LHF at 800-554-0723. And welcome back. We are studying Nehemiah chapter 7. We've gotten only through the first four verses, but it's important because the rest of our verses have a lot of names. And so it doesn't give us a lot of context, but what sets it up is these first four verses, the definition of faith, the fear of God, realizing that there's relationship with the Lord that makes the redeemed person want to do to please the heavenly father. And we see that with Nehemiah all the way through um, our text. So it comes down to faith, faith in the Lord. So uh, pastor, we're, we're through the first four verses. There are actually 73 verses in this chapter and don't let that fool you. Um, Most of them are only a few words long. So don't think we're going to be here all day, but pastor, is there anything else you want to highlight as we look at the list of returned exiles? I think as we as we head into this list again, just a reminder after that break of of where we're at. Right, uh, Jerusalem has um, has so much more potential for for people to be gathered into this this special holy city of God, and Nehemiah is uh, is on a mission to to build up God's people to gather them together. And there are not many people there. So there is definitely room for them to come back. I thought that was an interesting um, reality there, too, that there were many guards, but not a lot of people. So now the Lord provides once again. So here we are in verse 5, and we'll go all the way through verse 38, and then we'll talk further about what this means. 5 through 38, the list of returned exiles. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up at the first, and I found written in it, 
These were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Rahamiah, Nahamani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpareth, Bigvi, Nahum, and Bahana. The number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Parosh, 2,172. The sons of Shephatiah, 372. The sons of Era, 652. The sons of Pathamoab, namely the sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2,818. The sons of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Zatu, 854. The sons of Zakai, 760. The sons of Abinui, 648. The sons of Babai, 628. The sons of Asgid, 2322. The sons of Adonikam, 667. The sons of Bigvi, 2067. The sons of Adan, 655. The sons of Atar, namely of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Hashem, 328. The sons of Bezai, 324. The sons of Hareph, 112. The sons of Gibeon, 95. The men of Bethlehem and Nedophah, 188. The men, the men of Anathoth, 128. The men of Beth Asmavith, 442. Excuse me. The men of Kiriath Jerim, Sephirath and Baroth, 748. The men of Rama and Geba, 600, 621. The men of Michmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 123. The men of the other Nebo, 52. The sons of the other Elam, 1,254. The sons of Haram, 320. The sons of Jericho, 345. The sons of, of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 721. And the sons of Sena'a, 3,930. So, Pastor, I'm assuming you have your calculator right there. How many people have we counted so far? What do you think? Um, I, I didn't take my calculator. I know I had a few cheat notes. Um <laughs> That uh, this is from the, this record of the people who who first came back is is around sixteen thousand. Sixteen thousand. If, uh, okay. if they if they had their calculator out correctly, so disclaimer there, I didn't double check them. <laughs> That's good. So I really hearing this reminds me of recently one of our members had a family reunion. And I mean, for my family, we don't have a long history of family reunion. So I think maybe I went to one when I was a little kid, but I can't think of the last one that there would have been a Finnern or my other side, the, the Wilkening um, family reunions. I haven't heard of them, haven't gone to them, obviously, if, if I haven't heard of them. So there you have these family genealogies that show up and you have all of these names. And here that kind of reminds me of that, where people came from, all across different areas, probably from the exile in Babylonia and Persia, and they came back. And any thoughts on on that? Because it can you can get wound up in just the numbers and the names without really seeing the meaning in it. What do you think on these verses? Well, I think you really see a a, a connection of, of, like you say, a, a family that um, that is quite quite different from. Um, from what we do today, I mean, these uh, these groups are is it tribes not the right word, but um, you know, the, there's different groups that come together um and are are counted here, and we don't quite have that same understanding of of who we are when we we talk about who we are. It's very much um, you know, well. I'm, I'm part of the Whit family and I, I have a family tree and, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm American. Um, but, but from there, I mean, I'm pretty loosey goosey. Um, but right here you go through and you see this, 
this connection of history where they have, you know, the sons of, I'm not going to say any of those names that you just did, Brady. <laughs> um, but, I love it. But, but they have this, this connection that, that keeps on going. And, uh, you know, these are the moments that, again, I, I would think it's, it's always tempting to say, oh, that's a lot of unfamiliar, unfamiliar names and numbers. But, um, you know, when you get to things like this or, or the genealogy, it, it really shows um, how God tells a, a story of his people uh, that he gathers together in a special way uh, and brings together. So that, that Nehemiah come, goes back into the, the history books and, and sees how they, they gathered here and, and then deciding to kind of move forward using that as well um, is, is just an amazing testament that I think is, is hard, for, hard for us to comprehend um, in our Western culture or connect to. There's no person that is um, not important, as I as I read this, and I think about that because we have a, a family lineage of the Finnerns that goes back to approximately 1810, and this is in northern Germany, and so you have it just breaks off, and you read it, and I'm interested in these kind of things, but you lose track after a while. You're like, wait, how am I connected to this guy in California? I don't understand. Like how how he's not a Finnern, um, but yet he's related to me. How did this happen? And then you try to go back and try to figure it out. But th- that doesn't negate the reality that when you're going through that list, although taxing, that every single person is important. Because if it wasn't for that person, I would not be here. You know, that if that person went to met with that person, went to met with that person for the sake of marriage and having children and the connections that the relation has, I would not be here. And so God has has made this something that is very vital. No person is unimportant in those kind of lineages. And that's the same here. These are God's people going back to the homeland, going back to the promised land to not only um, worship the Lord, but to live in the place that they, he said that they would live. So there, there's, I mean, we don't know every single person, but it is pretty amazing how these 16,000 people that we know of um, are all inter- interconnected in the name of what we say Yahweh in those days. So that that's a kind of perspective that I saw with it because how easy is it for us is to kind of get like, oh, Come on, more lineages, you know, let's go back to the book of Numbers for Pete's sake and try to not sleep through that one. You know, it's crazy. But I think there's there's a lot more meaning to it than what first meets the eye. Other thoughts on these verses? Yeah, no, you said that you said it really well, Brady. I I can't I can't but just jump into uh, other other areas of of genealogy where this this really is even in a list, this really is part of the narrative. Um because because this is part of the story of people's lives who are gathered together by God. So, um, no, Brady, you, you said that beautifully. Thank um, you. Yeah, <laughs> good, good. I'm glad, I'm glad I went well. It kind of reminds me if you've seen the movie Dead Poet Society. Have you seen that movie? I haven't. Okay, so there's a part of that movie where Robin Williams is showing pictures of all these guys who have gone to this school, and they're all looking at these pictures, all these young men at the school, and he's in the background, and he says, carpe diem, carpe diem, you know, seize the day. And it shows all these pictures of these guys. And he says, you, I mean, I can't remember the exact quotes he says, but he's definitely saying all these guys have a story, and what connects them is carpe diem, you know, seize the day. And that's for you, gentlemen, to seize the day in your life. And it, it's quite motivational. I wanted to go learn Latin or something that when I was young, but, but it didn't happen obviously. Um, but it, it, it definitely shows that. And I feel like we don't need to have a motivational speech with this, but the importance of what unites them, Yahweh and the homeland that brought them together. So I think that's a, that's my attempt to make sure I have at least one movie quote every single episode. Okay. <laughs> verse 39, we'll go with 39 all the way through 56. We continue the priests, the son of Jediah, namely the house of Jeshua, 973. The sons of Imer, 1,052. The sons of Pashur, 1,247. The sons of Haram, 1,017. The Levites, the sons of Jeshua, namely of Kamil, of the sons of Hodava, 74. The singers, the sons of Asaph, 148. The gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Ater, the sons of Talmon, 
the sons of Acham, the sons of Hatita, the sons of Shobai, 138. The temple servants, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hashufa, the sons of Tabioth, the sons of Keros, the sons of Sia, the sons of Padan, the sons of Labana, the sons of Hagaba, the sons of Shalmai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Giddel, the sons of Gehar, the sons of Rehea, the sons of Razan, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Gazem, the sons of Uza, the sons of Pasea, the sons of Basai, the sons of Menim, the sons of Neshusheshim, ne- nephew Sheisim, the son of Bakebuk, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Harhur, the sons of Basleth, the sons of Meheda, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tema, the sons of Neziah, the sons of Hatifa. I'll keep going. The sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Sophereth, the sons of Perida, the sons of Jahal, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Gedel, the sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Hetil, the sons of Pachareth Hazabim, the sons of Ammon. So, Pastor, what are your thoughts on these verses? I was thinking if I gave somebody to to read that on a Sunday morning, they would say I owed them. <laughs> That's a right. Lot. You, you might need to get a, a just a nice small little drink after church. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> no, if don't. somebody told me a steak at dinner, I, I I wouldn't say I could deny them. No, that's um, exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, so, so any anything that you found in those verses? I think the the simplest thing that that sticks out is you have these the divisions of their positions. And, you know, if, if they were, uh, important Lutheran, Lutheran thinking, um, uh, backwards here, uh, anachronistically, I guess is the, the big word there. Yeah, right, um, right. then you'd see, you'd see these labels for, for these lists, right. Of these positions, these vocations, uh, there's the word I was going to bring up vocation. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So you have, uh, the priests, uh, the Levites and the temple servants. So, uh, these people by their, by their family, um, by their family connection, again, are reminded in their family connection, they actually have a special position too. And everybody has one, but, you know, these people's roles are uh, are the priests, the Levites, and the temple servants, the ones who are uh, to be in and around God's holy temple um, doing his things, doing his uh, sacrificial system and uh, the actions that uh, that he commanded his, his people to do. So, um it's moments like this where, again, this is very different because we, you know, we have our, uh, our, our tests of, um, where at least I did with a guidance counselor and they'd say, you know, what, what job do you want to do someday and what are your skills? And, um, you know, people ask you what you want to do, but I uh, hear you have this, this connection that again comes through your, your lineage, um, that's handed down and saying, you know, you are, you're in this special God given role, uh, vocation. Um, for these people in these in these families, and that's and that and that's a difficult part here. One of the one of the emphasis in Ezra two, but it talks about a ton of people that came back, but a relatively small amount of people were priests, Levites, and temple servants. And what I notice here is that it doesn't even list the number. If I'm right here, um, oh, it does it does list them. Excuse me, verse sixty. It's not a ton of temple servants. It's 392. I mean, you have all these other thousands of people with other um, realities, but the temple servants, although you list a ton of names, you don't see a lot of um, people in general. And so definitely the people who are set apart to this calling were few. You know, the, the, the work is great, but the laborers are few, I think comes to mind here as well, that there was a need but there definitely was not a huge number of people. Obviously, God has this in control. He knows it. You know, the more I read about trying to figure out what those numbers mean, the less you know and the more theories come into your mind. Um, you know what I'm saying? And so you look at these numbers and you see the importance of, although the numbers were not great, the emphasis was very much so there. So they're not just going back 
to the homeland just to live there. They're there to go worship the Lord. And, and why, why is that important for us when it comes to um, looking at our lives as Christians? Why is it that we need a place to worship? Why is it that that place was set apart? Why would God's people need that temple when they, you know, quote in our language today, say there's so much other stuff we could be doing. Um, God doesn't expect too much, doesn't expect us to worship all the time, does he? I mean, why is it important that he set that part aside for the sake of God's people? Yeah, no, that's a great question that seems to be coming up, especially uh, in the times that we're in. Um, so I ultimately think of it as, uh, I mean, the, the, the simplest way to say it is God says so, right? He gave them this way this way to do it, right? So you're like, okay, but um, okay, what's the next step, right? It's the question that everybody wants to ask, you know, because I said so, okay, but, but you know, why? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but this, this, this is how God expresses himself. Um, and at least that's how I think of it. God, when God tells people, this is what I want, um, to happen. This is what I want to set up. This is the role. Um, he's expressing himself in some specific way, right? When, when we follow his truth, um, it's not just right and wrong. It's actually God reflecting, uh, who he is to us and, and what his will is in our life and what's best for us. So, um, and the system we have set up, we talk about coming together. Well, you know, we've been reminded in these times that that people are meant to meant to gather together, and they're especially meant to gather together uh, in worship of our Lord, um, in in raising in this system, raising sacrifices to Him, uh, a reminder of of their of their sin, um, a reflection of their offering, um, but even more so, uh, coming together in in being gathered as God's people physically, right? We can see the numbers. Um, they could see Nehemiah's billboard and say, you know, come back, come back to Jerusalem, you know, uh, where your roots are, God's city, you know, the reminder there. Um, you could say, yeah, I'm living in Jerusalem. You know, I'm one of God's people. It's Zion, his, his holy city. Um, you know, and here, here I'm good with myself, but he takes it, you know, a step, a step further and says, no, I'm, I'm bringing you closer together. Um, closer together around me and my gifts, just like we do on, on Sunday morning, right? We say, I, Jesus is with me every step of the way, but there's a special time when God says, gather with me and gather with others to receive my special gifts. Because um, ultimately, if we're, <laughs> God is showing us, this is what eternity looks like, right? This, this is everlasting life. Um, this is gathering together and worshiping him with others, um, I think of it night and day. And I, of course I think with that steak dinner, I think about, you know, when am I going to eat? But God says, I'll take care of it. You know, I'm gathering you together. Worship me. Um, that's what it's all about. And this reminds me of, it, it, it brings us back to the, the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. We should fear and love God. So do not despise preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. And it, it's interesting to me how that is something that, is not only a tradition where you say, well, you built a church because that's what your parents did. Um, you built a church because that's just, you know, something that you think is of cultural value. Um, or people, when you go to an old church and you look at it and go, wow, that's a really nice church. I mean, those people, um, why did they do that? Well, it was more than just, that's what we had in Germany, therefore we have it in America. You know, or that is something that we had in the past, is that from the very beginning, there's a desire to worship the Lord, and there's a way that God has set it up for us to worship the Lord. And you and I have a, um, a common uh, background with Bethlehem and, and St. Louis, and and mm-hmm. at that church, continuously, you would have people who very is very visible that when people walked into the church, they knew they were standing on holy ground. <laughs> Am I correct? Oh, yeah. Experience? <laughs> yeah. They oh, knew yeah. It. They knew it. And they knew they needed to be in the house of the Lord. And when when you would preach your first sermon, um, they knew something grand was happening as well. Sometimes, re- sometimes speaking to you in the middle of your sermon, which we're not quite used to as Lutherans, but definitely something that connected you to realize that this was different than what was happening in the world. And that's kind of the glimpse that I see when he's separating these individuals, although not many, 
um, that these individuals were vital to the life of the Israelites as they went back home. Why? Because the temple was there for the sake of the soul, the care of each person's soul. So any any connections you have with uh, you know our common um, background with Bethlehem and the house of the Lord and why they set this aside? <laughs> oh, Bethlehem brings all kinds of stories back. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I was just thinking as you were saying that you can. Um, you know, t- talking about the, the fear of the Lord, you you can get a sense, um, you know, af- after the worship time is done and, and the usual routines are, are done there. Um, but you can get a sense for if, you know, if the church is first, uh, you know, first an institution um, or if it's first a place to pursue God um, in a culture um, or after you're talking to somebody for a while. So this is that, this is that reminder of, of how God reminds us that this is a special place. Uh, a special body, special place. So let's continue on. We have about six minutes left here, Pastor, and I will read 61 all the way through 73. The following were those who came up from Tel Mela, Tel Harsha, Sherab, Adon, and Imar. But they could not prove their father's houses nor their descent, whether they belonged to Israel. The sons of Deleah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nekuda. 642. Also of the priests, the sons of Hobiah, the sons of Hakos, the sons of Barzillai, who had taken a wife of the daughters of Barzillai the Gilead, who would call by, who was and was called by their name. These sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but it was not found there, and they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until a priest of Urim or Thummim should arise. The whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337. They also had 245 singers, male and female. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, and their donkeys 6,720. Now some of the heads of fathers' houses gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 derricks of gold, 50 basins, 30 priests' garments, and 500 minas of silver. And some of the heads of the fathers' houses gave into the treasury of the work 20,000 derricks of gold and 2,200 minas of silver. And what the rest of the people gave was 20,000 derricks of gold, 2,000 minas of silver, and 67 priest garments. So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the temple servants, and all of Israel lived in their towns. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. So after we hear of everything in chapter 7, we hear of more numbers. First of all, Pastor, did you notice anything or anything stick out with these numbers and these people? Uh, I I know there's lots of lots of symbolism meaning behind some of these numbers here, but I don't want to be derailed by that today. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. We could easily get caught in the weeds, no doubt about it. Um, and so as we look at all these numbers and look at all these people, and it tells us pretty much at the end, the people of Israel were in their towns. It's kind of a nice little, I'd say, wrapping to the present, if you will. What is this telling us about all these names, all these people? And what does it mean in those last, that last verse, that people were in their towns? Yeah, this is when I look at these these names, these numbers, and, and, and gathering at the end here. I mean, it's it's kind of a sum up of look look what God has done, right? Look look what He has brought together, and it's one of those moments you could actually compare. Like this isn't this actually this actually pales into comparison to uh, to who came back initially from Babylon, um, but here you have another sign of of God's provision with His people, and in that. Uh, that seventh month, um, the people were, they were in their towns. They were, they were settling. Um, and, and maybe it wasn't the, the big dream that, uh, you know, that, that Nehemiah really hoped for. Maybe, maybe the billboard didn't quite get as many people. Um, but ultimately the bottom, the bottom line here is people have, have gathered back. Um, they've gathered back to, 
to where they've been called. Uh, Jerusalem is, is one step further along. Uh, they're going to be gathered around uh, Ezra reading here soon. And so, so whether it's, whether it's as fast as, uh, as Nehemiah wants or not, or um, as we want or not, uh, God has, has ga- is gathering his people together um, as we look at the final verses. And so they, they have reclaimed God's promise through Jeremiah that the people would come back. And there really is no, I don't think there's really a way for us to be able to relate with this because this is a prophecy that we see throughout Jeremiah, especially, that they are back to where they need to be. And the, the hard part is not everyone came back. I mean, we see this in the New Testament that you have the dispersion. You have um, people from Israel that were taken away from Assyria. You have the Babylonians. And people pretty much were spread around, um, well, basically since the split of the kingdoms, um, to be honest. And so there's a lot of joy there, but then there's grief as well. And I would compare it to something along the lines of when a church wants to maybe build a new sanctuary or even as something as simple as Christmas. You gather together with your family, but then there are always, not always, but a lot of times those Christmases or when you finally have that church built and you sit in those sanctuary or you sit at your home for Christmas and there's some people who are just not there, which brings much joy that you're together, but also grief because it's not what it once was. So pastor, as we look at this, God has kept his promises, but yet there's still grief. How does that, in about a minute, how does this whole chapter, what does it mean, what does it tell us, and how can it relate to today? Well, you have this gathering again of, of people together. Nehemiah has, has uh, toiled so hard to be, to be a leader, and he sees, um, or at least we see, maybe more in reflection, we see God's provision coming together. And Nehemiah has, has come through struggles, and they will continue, um, but he's also uh, come through uh, great, great victories as well. So, uh, in this, you see, um, the I think the everyday human struggle of uh, identifying with Nehemiah and and God doing what God does, uh, bringing people together uh, so they can be His people through everything that that we see and that we don't see. Pastor Lucas Witt of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Baltimore, Maryland, given us God's strong word from Nehemiah chapter seven. Pastor Witt, thank you for being our guest. My pleasure, Brady. Saints of our Lord, God keeps his promises. And we might see this lineage and wonder what is going on. But at the same time, we see this lineage that comes from David. We see it continually throughout that God keeps his promises, that the promise of the king, the king of kings, would come from this David. And we see that promise of the temple being rebuilt, the wall that surrounds us. And who do we see in all of it? We see Christ. And when we see Christ, we give thanks for each and every individual that our Lord calls as his own because he has also called you. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hands.